Hey everybody, this is a document that I missed for the last video. This was a document that was filed by the state just before 5 p.m. So here I am, it's late at night, wearing my Coke bottle glasses here, but I did want to get this document out for you guys who are very interested in the case. So just hitting the highlights here. As you guys may know, Daniel Rashbaum filed a motion to keep out the wiretaps, which I think is going to fail. Those wiretaps came in to the previous trials involving Katie McBenua and Secreta Garcia. So for those same reasons, I expect them to come in as evidence against Charlie. So first, the state says the defendant has standing to challenge only his intercepts. He can challenge his intercepts of his device, but not Katie McBenua's. Says the information contained in the original wiretap application was not stale and was sufficient for probable cause. So that was Ratchbaum's main argument was that um, there was too much time elapsed between the time that there was probable cause and the time that the wiretaps happened because the wiretaps were from 2016. Dan Markell was shot and killed back in 2014. So I'll just scroll this through for people who really, really want to read every single thing in the case. And it's great to see so many people are interested in this case and justice for Dan Markell. Defense counsel asserts that the information in the probable cause affidavit was stale by the time of the application for the intercept. Okay, so they're talking about how Katie was still being paid for her murder and the cover-up in 2016. I think this is incorrect because they're saying that Lexus was transferred to McPenwa from Charles Adelson, but I had always heard that that was Harvey's car that was transferred to her. So if someone knows for sure, please drop that in the comments. So throughout 2016, she was still being paid by the Adelson Institute with no evidence that she actually worked there. So there were still lots of communications going on between the family. Okay, so this is worth pointing out. In considering the overall circumstances of this case, it is plain to see the enormous amount of investigation it took to even develop suspects in the case to begin with, from combing through city bus footage to identify suspicious cars, to monitoring toll booth and interstate activity, rental car payments, cell tower dumps, interviews with witnesses across the state of Florida, collaboration across jurisdictions and agencies, review of financial records, communication, social media, motel stays, traffic tickets, surveillance footage, cell site data, and location information, and more, dot, dot, dot. The probable cause to establish the suspects in the case and the murder for hire plot was not only sufficient, but ongoing at the time law enforcement planned the, quote, bump. Okay, so they're talking about pen registers. There was probable cause to believe that cell alert phones were the way the parties had communicated and continued to communicate. So then they talk about the bump. The chatter that occurred between the co-conspirators in an attempt to handle the, quote, blackmailer was brand new communication that could only be intercepted by the use of the wire. With this new evidence, the argument of stale probable cause becomes moot because new evidence was being created at the time of the intended interception. Okay, necessity requirement and the standard for wiretap intercepts. So they're talking about Florida law types of communications that can be intercepted. In determining whether the interception in this case was proper, the court must examine the case on its own facts and consider each alternative investigative procedure against the totality of the objectives sought by the intercept. The showing must be that one, other reasonable investigative procedures that have been tried and either have failed or reasonably appear likely to fail or to be too dangerous, B or two, or if other techniques have not been tried, the reasons why they reasonably appear to be unlikely to succeed if tried or to be too dangerous. C, viz, that war tapping appears the most reasonable investigative technique under the circumstances to secure other and conclusive evidence of criminal involvement. Okay, so they talk about the surveillance of the targets. Okay, they're saying that um, just 
surveillance alone wouldn't allow them to know the actual content of the meeting. Okay, McBenner and Garcia live together, had a family together, no amount of surveillance of a couple who lives together and presents themselves as a married couple would alert law enforcement of suspicious activity without knowing about the discussions themselves. Okay, so they're just talking about the necessity of doing the wiretaps as opposed to just spying on them. Okay, continued use of pen registers. Okay. This is where it gets pretty interesting. And thanks also to Fancy Fiction for pointing this part out during her live stream earlier this evening. <coughs> the murder of Dan Markell involved a conspiracy structure that is anything but what would be true of a normal murder investigation. In the application for the intercept, which incorporated the probable cause affidavit, the aff affiant explained in excruciating detail the flow of communication, which started with Dan Markell's ex-wife. Wendy Adelson would talk to her mother and brother. Her brother would meet and talk with his ex-girlfriend, Catherine McBanua, and Catherine McBanua would meet with Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera. However, for any successful conviction for any of the co-conspirators, law enforcement needed to learn who knew what, who ordered what, who paid for what, and who covered up what. The application explained that pen registers were in fact valuable to the investigation, but its use reached its limitations once content became the only evidence necessary to the investigation. The application did not, in full print, not have misstatements or material omissions, as the court found in Blackman, and did contain a description of pen registers limitations. It cannot provide the evidence to specifically identify the co-conspirators or the nature and scope of the illegal scheme. Okay, so this is where... Okay, they're saying talking with Luis Rivera or Katie McBanua wouldn't have given enough insight into the Adelson family and who was behind this murder. Um, in fact, it would probably tip them off, it would have tipped off the Adelsons and inevitably end any investigation which would shed light on the structure of the conspiracy. Okay, so and Charlie's attorneys are also claiming that search warrants of the cell devices and residences were not exhausted before application for the intercept. Um, the state is saying there was nothing to be gained from searching their residences two years later. And there was no more physical evidence that was outstanding to be searched. Um, it also could have uh, been dangerous and likely to be for nothing. Well, again, this is kind of interesting because they're talking about Garcia's propensity for violence and ties to the Latin kings, but I thought it was pretty much established or understood that Garcia was not part of the gang, but it was just Luis Rivera. So, um, okay. So not only would evidence on their phones have been stale, but like attempted interviews, serving search warrants on the co-conspirators would alert the parties to law enforcement's presence and the investigation and its objectives would have ended. So that makes sense to me. So, you know, I mean, call me biased, but I think the state should win here on this issue. So the state is requesting that the court enter an order denying defendant's motion to suppress evidence derived from wiretap interceptions. Okay, so once again, I'm totally beat. It's very late here. So um, just wanted to put this out there so people who are very interested will be able to read this document for themselves. So thank you guys for your continued interest in this case and caring about Dan Markell. His birthday is October 9th. So if I do have time and the ability to do so, hopefully I'll be able to live stream again that evening. He would have been 51 years old. I'll just scroll through this again in case anybody really wants to slow it down, read every single word. Okay, so let's get back to that point where they are alleging that the communications started with Wendy. This brings us back to 
Chris, Christopher to cost questioning Wendy and starting it out by saying something like, we're all here. This is all because of you. It's all because of you and your failed marriage. So Wendy acted like she was very confused and didn't seem to get his line of questioning. But this looks like it's basically the state's theory also was that communication would start with Wendy. Then she would talk to Donna and Charlie. Charlie would then talk with Katie. Katie would talk with Segredo and Lewis. So I'm really hoping that Katie does have some really good information to share. After all, she looked totally, I don't know, totally ecstatic in her mugshot picture from a couple of days ago. Okay, thank you guys. I will tune out now. Time to conk out for the day. Have a good evening. Hope to see you guys on Saturday evening, where I hope to have a lot more energy for the comedy. Take care.